that these events are happening now, or rather will hold that they happen now when the light from the events reaches them. Events happening on the railway behind the train will be post-dated by an exactly equal amount. We have thus a two-fold correction to make in the date of an event when we pass from the terrestrial observers to the travellers. We must first take five-fourths of the time as estimated by the earth dwellers and then subtract three-fourths of the time that it would take light to travel from the event in question to the earth dwellers. One of the main motives of this whole theory is to secure that the velocity of light should be the same for all observers, however they may be moving. This fact, established by experiment, was incompatible with the old theories and made it absolutely necessary to admit something startling. The theory of relativity is just as little startling as is compatible with the facts. After a time, it ceases to seem startling at all. There is another feature of very great importance in the theory we have been considering, and that is that although distances and times vary for different observers, we can derive from them a quantity called interval, which is the same for all observers. The interval in the special theory of relativity is obtained as follows. Take the square of the distance between two events, and the square of the distance travelled by light in the time between the two events, subtract the lesser of these from the greater, and the result is defined as the square of the interval between the events. The interval is the same for all observers, and represents a genuine physical relation between the two events, which the time and the distance do not. When we come to the general theory of relativity, we shall have to generalize the notion of interval. The more deeply we enter into the structure of the world, the more important this concept becomes. We are tempted to say that it is the reality of which distances and periods of time are confused representations. The theory of relativity has altered our view of the fundamental structure of the world. That is the source both of its difficulty and of its importance. The special theory of relativity, which we have been considering hitherto, solved completely a certain definite problem, to account for the experimental fact that when two bodies are in uniform relative motion, all the laws of physics, both those of ordinary dynamics and those connected with electricity and magnetism, are exactly the same for the two bodies. Uniform motion here means motion in a straight line with constant velocity. But although one problem was solved by the special theory, another was immediately suggested. What if the motion of the two bodies is not uniform? Suppose, for instance, that one is the earth, while the other is a falling stone. The stone has an accelerated motion. It is continually falling, faster and faster. Nothing in the special theory enables us to say that the laws of physical phenomena will be the same for an observer on the stone as for one on the earth. This is particularly awkward, as the earth itself is, in an extended sense, a falling body. It has at every moment an acceleration towards the sun, acceleration here being change in direction, not speed, which makes it go round the sun instead of moving in a straight line. As our knowledge of physics is derived from experiments on the earth, we cannot rest satisfied with a theory in which the observer is supposed to have no acceleration. The general theory of relativity removes this restriction and allows the observer to be moving in any way, straight or crooked, uniformly or with an acceleration. In the course of removing the restriction, Einstein was led to his new law of gravitation. The work was extraordinarily difficult, and occupied him for ten years. The special theory dates from 1905, the general theory from 1915. It is obvious from experiences with which we are all familiar that an accelerated motion is much more difficult to deal with than a uniform one. When you are in a train which is travelling steadily, the motion is not noticeable so long as you do not look out of the window. But when the brakes are applied suddenly, you are precipitated forwards, and you become aware that something is happening without having to notice anything outside the train. Similarly, in a lift, 
Everything seems ordinary while it is moving steadily, but at starting and stopping, when motion is accelerated, you have an odd sensation in the pit of your stomach. We call a motion accelerated when it is getting slower as well as when it is getting quicker. When slower, the acceleration is negative. All these facts are familiar, and they led Galileo and Newton to regard an accelerated motion as something radically different in its own nature from a uniform motion. But this distinction could only be maintained by regarding motion as absolute, not relative. If all motion is relative, the Earth is accelerated relatively to a lift, just as truly as the lift relatively to the Earth. Yet the people on the Earth have no sensations in the pits of their stomachs when the lift starts to go up. This illustrates the difficulty of our problem. In fact, though few physicists in modern times have believed in absolute motion, the technique of mathematical physics still embodied Newton's belief in it, and a revolution in method was required to obtain a technique free from this assumption. This revolution was accomplished in Einstein's general theory of relativity. It is somewhat arbitrary where we begin in explaining the new ideas which Einstein introduced, but perhaps we shall do best by taking the concept of interval. This concept, as it appears in the special theory of relativity, is already a generalization of the traditional notion of distance in space and time. But it is necessary to generalize it still further. However, it is necessary first to explain a certain amount of history, and for this purpose we must go back as far as Pythagoras. Pythagoras was roughly a contemporary of Confucius and Buddha. He founded a religious sect, which thought it wicked to eat beans, and a school of mathematicians who took a particular interest in right-angled triangles. The theorem of Pythagoras, the 47th proposition of Euclid, states that the sum of the squares on the two shorter sides of a right-angled triangle is equal to the square on the side opposite the right angle. No proposition in the whole of mathematics has had such a distinguished history. We learn to, quotes, prove it at school. In fact, the proposition is not quite true. It is only approximately true. But everything in geometry and subsequently in physics has been derived from it by successive generalizations. One of these generalizations is the general theory of relativity. About twenty centuries later, Descartes made Pythagoras' theorem the basis of the method of analytical geometry. Suppose you wish to map out systematically all the places on a piece of land. We will suppose it's small enough to make it possible to ignore the fact that the earth is round. One of the simplest ways of describing the position of a place is to say, starting from my house, go first such and such a distance east, then such and such a distance north, or it might be west in the first case and south in the second. This tells you exactly where the place is. Think of New York. You will be told to go so many blocks east or west, and then so many blocks north or south. The distance you have to go east is called X, and the distance you have to go north is called Y. If you have to go west, x is negative. If you have to go south, y is negative. If you adopt Descartes' method of mapping, the theorem of Pythagoras gives you the distance from place to place. If you go four kilometers east and three north, you will be five kilometers from home. But now suppose that instead of taking a small piece of the Earth's surface which can be regarded as flat, you consider making a map of the world.